Hello, and thank you so much for joining us today for the webinar Immediate and Early Implant Placement, Decision Criteria and Technique for Achieving Long-Term Success. It is a great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Peter Ranzhofer. Dr. Peter Ranzhofer studied dentistry in Munich, Germany, and received his training in prosthetics and implant dentistry at the University of Freiburg, Germany. In 2001, he was appointed Assistant Director of the Center for Implantology and Periodontology, a private practice in Amstelveen, Netherlands. In 2002, he received his certification as an implantologist from the NVOL, the Dutch Oral Implantology Association. From 2005 to 2009, he worked at the Center for Implantology and Periodontology. In 2009, he founded the Group Practice for Implantology and Periodontology in Munich, Germany, together with Dr. Claudio Cacacci. Dr. Ranzhofer is author of numerous publications and he is an internationally renowned speaker. He is active as a trainer and teacher at various institutions in the Netherlands and Germany. And he is a member of several national and international study groups. We would like to thank Dr. Ranzhofer for being with us today and Botis for making this lecture possible. Please take note of any questions and comments you have during the lecture, as they will be addressed by Dr. Ranzhofer at the end of the presentation. Without any further delay, please help me welcome the expert himself, Dr. Peter Ranzhofer. Okay, I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Um, thank you very much for the introduction and um, dear colleagues, thank you for joining the lecture today this evening or maybe later during recording and um, I'm starting right away with the topic and the um, topic is immediate or delayed implant placement and I'm sure there are a lot of things to discuss about this topic and I would like to start with you right away um, with this webinar. Um, if you look at the slide Implantology should be, in my opinion, as easy as possible and as complex as necessary. And when we are looking at um, the outcome here, we can just see over this X-ray presentation and maybe if this patient will appear in your office, maybe the best solution is not to treat this patient or maybe if we have a chance not to treat him, it's um, probably a good option because sometimes the best case is the one you never started. And I think here are so many things um, complicated or maybe going wrong or went wrong that it's a big, big problem to uh, get rid of it. And um, so we should try not to have complications in our cases. At least this is what uh, we really like to have in our office. And um, it's always a team approach, so that means when you are treating implant cases or patients anyhow in any discipline of dental medicine, I think um, a team approach is very important and you need a certain network to have specialists on your side who can help you in some situations or who just um, join your team to um, some disciplines where you are not so uh, capable with. And, um, here you see my uh, friend and colleague Claudia Kakachi and on the other side Uwe Geringer and um, Hans-Joachim Lotz which are very very gifted and very good dental technicians who I personally need a lot for my implant cases. It means in 50% um, of uh, the patients we treat it's um, surgery and uh, prosthodontics and the other half is sent by referring dentists and where we just do the surgery ourselves and where we send back the patient. And um, what you can see here on the right side, um, the soft tissue, um, there you need a team and your prosthodontist or yourself, if you do it yourself, needs a certain know-how to be able to um, to bring the soft tissues in the shape and the form you, you want to have them for later uh, regarding good aesthetics and of course good function and biological functioning over the years and um, if you don't have the right dental technician I think you have uh, a big problem because this is where the dental technician starts with the surgery of the plaster cast models and um, transferring you or giving you devices to um, do your uh, prosthetic work or your temporarization or prototype crowns however you want to name them and um, I think um, it's a big chance for dental technicians 
to really have an exchange or to talk with us on, on one level in implant uh, dentistry and uh, this is really what we need. So my opinion the team plays a major role and um, no matter if you are uh, if you agree with uh, all of the points or with some of the points or no matter how many is what I say I think dentistry especially implant dentistry is never black or white it's always a gray zone where techniques material hardware or whatsoever that are you're using and which are working in your hand maybe are not working in my hand so I think we should be open and free enough to change our uh, treating concepts um, in one or the other way and not uh, stick uh, only to one opinion because um, it's depending on the team, on the patient, on the motivation, on the skills uh, that you have um, as a surgeon or as a prosthodontist and um, there's always some space for maybe doing things differently. Um, and this gives a great example. Imagine if this patient comes to your office and he is missing four front teeth. You can decide of placing maybe four implants or two implants. And um, this is clear. And um, then um, if you would ask me, I would say never place four because I'm much better when I can use Pontix in between my implants. So I would always prefer to have one, one of the other solutions. Um, for example, when I was trained in Freiburg, back in the late 90s, we wanted to have two implants placed on laterals because we thought we cannot manage this area here so well, this instantial area at the two front teeth. So we said, okay, we stick away from the area we don't want to deal with because it's so difficult to place the implants at the laterals. Later on, I decided maybe it's better to take one central and one lateral, um, or maybe the other way around, um, depending on the bone quality we find in the situation and um, even much later, actually pretty new or in the last two years, if you give me the chance and if the bone is okay, um, I would always place it like this, two central um, incisors as um, the host of the implants and to have pontix in the area 1-2 and 2-2 uh, um, at the laterals. And the reason is because um, it's very difficult, in my opinion, to place the laterals of the implant at the laterals close enough to the canines. It's always a little bit more to the mesial, or in many, many cases. And then I, um, I have an aesthetic problem in this area here, which I don't want to have. So if you give me the chance, it means if the bone is good enough, I would prefer to place them in the central incisors and not go to the laterals. If I have to, because it's very difficult to place implants here and, and regarding to um, or um, with the need of making big, big surgical um, risks and um, augmentations vertically and, and horizontally. I would always prefer to place a more lateral if the bone there is uh, okay. And um, so I think uh, this is the way um, I wanted to show you how I discuss my cases with myself or with the team and how we do our um, treatment decisions. And um, this is something um, I would like to have in, in all of my cases, which I don't, by the way. This is implant um, placed in this region, 2-1, and um, this is a prototype crown, just a very simple um, temporary crown in order to manage to stabilize myself tissue in the way I would like to have it. And this is what you see here. And um, this is a guarantee at least at this moment and hopefully for even longer, to have good aesthetics and good functioning of the soft tissue. And this is very important to me. And um, I would like to discuss with you a few techniques how we can provide in many, many cases to have the situation like this. What you see on the right side is my favorite abutment. And um, not because it's um, a zirconia abutment, maybe two, but um, not only. And if I would cement a crown here, it would be cemented so deep under the soft tissue. This is no way of cleaning this area and a big risk for periodontitis due to cementitis of um, implants. This is my favorite implant or abutment because of the fact that it's a hybrid abutment. And this is how our um, abutments always look like uh, or in almost every case, especially for front tooth cases. Um, that means a titanium Connection to the titanium implant, very important to me, stable, safe connection, simple, easy, 
and uh, connection with a um, zirconium ceramic material, very nice and gentle to the soft tissue, as we know, and my favorite material to have contact with um, with the soft tissue or with the keratinized gingiva at this point, and connected later on with a beautiful, maybe a lithium desilicate crown on top or um, a um, baked, individual baked um, ceramic material on top of um, zircon dioxide ceramics. And altogether it should be um, screw retained because then we have very clean, um, a very clean situation and no cementation problems in this area and um, we can easily shape this material, this soft tissue for a good result. And um, also having a few words for the hardware, I prefer to have um, implant types which give us a chance to have a platform shifting and this is what you see here, a little bit more space around the neck of the implant with the abutment and um, which means to me that I have more soft tissue at the area where I would like to have it coming out of the soft tissue here at the emergence profile. So I am a big fan of having a little bit um, less diameter at the level of the neck of our implant. So platform shifting for many reasons is for me um, a good solution. And here you see the crown and this is something which is only due to the fact that I'm, uh, I can be happy to work with um, very gifted dental technicians. This was made by Andreas Nolte in Münster and um, yeah, this is something which I cannot influence just with the choice of the right dental technician. The patient was very happy and that means I was very happy and the result here is stable. This is what um, is uh, my first interest of course because I know with a good partner this area will look very, very nice and good anyway. So, even more important, this is a result three years after. Very stable, still very healthy, no recession, no aesthetic um, um, problems occurring, really nice situation and uh, healthy situation. And this is what I wish all of you that we have many, many cases um, with happy patients and uh, good situations and stable situations around our implants. So which technique, which method is the right way um, to success? And of course there are um, many ways, there's a German saying uh, which says there are many ways of, of not coming. Um, there are many ways, um, or maybe the presentation doesn't show um, when I have uh, something put into. There are many ways to guide to Rome and um, we just have to choose the right one. And here in the background you see Rome. And um, I will discuss with you a few things now um, at the beginning of my lecture um, where I think it's worth of thinking about. Of course, when we look at our implant cases, we have an anatomic situation and um, we have to deal with bony defects. When we lose a tooth, we have a lot of resorption, of course, or maybe we had an accident with even more um, resorption defects and we have a structural environment, which is different with dental implants. And that means to um, rebuild the situation um, it used to be, we need a ridge or socket augmentation. We need a certain augmentation material, um, homologous material or autologous material, oxenogen material. All these are points we will discuss um, in the near future. Um, we need hard and soft tissue augmentation in any case. And um, the time of the implant placement is very, very important and even more important to me is the soft tissue. It plays a major role. Today we don't only want to augment bone um, and augment something, we want to have an integration of our prosthetic work into the soft tissue and then we are successful in my opinion and uh, we can um, think about having long-term uh, predictable results with our restorations. And what you see down here is emergence profile and um, um, very nice soft tissue around the implants. Of course, um, again, I wanted to work with Pontix, so I didn't want to place six implants here. Uh, we're missing teeth one, three, two, two, three. And um, I think we can have a better result if we really shape the soft tissue with our um, prosthetic work. And um, what we have here, this is um, non-functioning scar tissue. This is um, really different than the tissue we have around our teeth and we have to work or we have to deal with it differently and it's more complex and more complicated. 
We have structural change, structural changes in there. We have um, different kind and uh, different amount of blood vessels and perfusion. We have um, different fibers or direction of the fibers around those implants. And the quality of the soft tissue is also different. And um, yeah, it's functional scar, scar tissue. But this gives us, uh, this gives us a chance to stabilize it um, with our prosthetic work or with our temporization or healing apartment, even due to the time when we place the implant. And all those are um, features which we need to know and we need to take into consideration. And of course, what we never should forget, forget um, soft tissue and hard tissue is not made to, to live around or to, to, um, to stay around our implants or, or around our prosthetic work. So it's um, a vascular material and um, we can be happy that it's working so well anyway. And um, we have to deal with certain tricks in order to give the illusion to the patient or to the people who are looking at the cases or to us that we have a natural tooth in here and not an artificial root with um, dead material on top. And screw retained temporization on this implant at 2 1, what you see here. So, coming back to our topic, um, we need to know what happens after tooth loss. And um, in 2004, at uh, the big congress in Lucerne, I heard a lecture from Jan Linde, who um, talked one hour, uh, Professor Jan Linde, who talked one hour about um, the resorption of an alveolar alveolar site um, after tooth extraction. And I thought, mm, okay, um, why is he talking so intense about this topic? Because I know what's happening when, um, when I'm losing the tooth. Um, but um, later on, I really um, appreciate uh, this lecture because this is really very important. And um, as I found out now, the, the dental um, region, the upper and the lower jaw are the fastest resorbing material in our body. Um, so if we have to face a tooth loosening, um, resorption appears very fast. So now we want to focus on our anterior teeth. And I think this is really where we have to talk about immediate implant placement or delayed immediate implant placement. And um, if you look at this patient, um, he's not so happy right now. And why is uh, he here? He lost um, three front teeth and um, broke the right, uh, as a left um, lateral. So this was due to a bicycle accident. And um, I, coming from, um, from an office in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, I was uh, trained a lot with those front tooth accidents. And because, um, as you can imagine, in Amsterdam it's always wet and uh, the streets are uh, always slippery, especially in winter. A lot of bicycles, as you know, of course, and at every corner, at least 30 bars. So um, all the students who um, were on the way home had a big risk of, of falling with their bikes and having these kind of accidents. So I saw this quite often, and it also gives the patients a lot of psychological stress because we want, or they want us to repair this region, and this is very difficult. And um, so we really have to discuss what to do, and uh, we have to make decisions all the time um, in order to get the right treatment. Solution. So this patient I saw here one week after the front tooth accident and it was referred to me by a uh, colleague from the Munich University Prosthetic Department, Dr. Reza Sidipur, and um, we discussed when and how and, and, and uh, uh, of course we wanted to place implants, um, but we, we, we had to discuss when and which way. And of course I am as a surgeon, um, I have to make um, the surgical decisions. And I said, okay, let's make a planning and let's see how the teeth are looking or should look like in the future. So we made, measure, made measurements. And of course, I knew it's not enough space to place three implants. So I, my first um, wish was anyway to place two. And um, then if you uh, think about what I told you before, I wanted to place uh, two implants in the central incisors. And of course, I have to deal, probably have to deal with more resorption or bigger defect in this area here um, than in the others, but I think placing an implant at 1-2 uh, and 1-1 one, one is, no, um, is no real solution because I don't want to have a big pontic uh, at region 2-1. So, okay, I said I have to deal anyway with 2-1 and uh, so I decided to place two implants in the central incisors. And if you look at the soft tissue, 
where about one week after the accident it doesn't look so bad here, um, but still not good enough for me to be happy to do surgery in this kind of soft tissue situation. So I said, okay, I will wait for eight weeks or maybe from then on six more weeks and have a nice closure of the soft tissue um, in order to be able to close everything and to do all the kind of augmentation I want to have. And um, I think it's better to, to start pretty early in order to, um, to, compensate, to compensate the resorption which will go on in this region if I wait even longer. So to me, if I um, have to wait because of the soft tissues, the accident already happened, I think um, eight weeks is a nice guideline to start with uh, placing implants. Um, because I can still only do augmentation if the situation is too bad to do both, placing implants and to, um, to augment. <coughs> so um, the criteria is to me to have a closed and safe soft tissue situation at the point of the implant surgery. This was a removable um, device we had. Um, we also used it for the planning and it's not useful for the planning because um, if you look at the red um, shield here, it uh, will um, camouflage the vertical bone defect. So if I like to do my planning uh, surgical-wise, I always want to have only the white teeth and the length I want to have them later or in the ideal situation. And then I can decide myself, is this possible to augment and to have only white aesthetics on my implants or is this uh, necessary to have um, red aesthetics if I'm not good enough to augment so much or Maybe if I need to send it away to somebody else who can do this or to decide if I can or need a removable device better than a uh, fixed device. So um, anyway, it was working for the patients in this case as a provisional and um, I went on with my surgical planning. And what you see here uh, is a situation model after maybe two or three weeks after the accident. And um, for me, the important part is the circulatory outline of the teeth I want to have later on. So this gives me the information where or how deep I should place my implants. Three-dimensional implant positioning means um, smaller diameters than, than we used to place maybe, so no 5-0 or 6-0 in the central incisors, maybe a 4-3 or 4-0 or a 3-8, better than thicker implants because we can stay away from the tissue we want to spare, this is here, so it's better to spare and to prevent than to build up. And I need the outline here to get the ideal position, which is three millimeters for me below the circulatory outline I want to have later on in a two piece uh, bone level implant uh, designs. So you see, the planning is very important. Then, due to um, the surgical approach, I like to do my incision a little bit placed to the palatal side in order to stay away from the areas I want or I need to augment and of course um, to be able um, to prevent after resorb if you have a little bit of resorption which you can always have and you always will have but in a bigger amount then your scar tissue won't be on the facial aspect of this um, approximal uh, papillae which we don't want to have. So I think to have a more palatal incision is a better solution and of course um, when we augment in this area here then um, we are away with the suturing outline or with the incision from this uh, delicate areas. What you see here now is uh, bony structures after uh, eight weeks after the accident. And I think this is still nice enough to, to do both, to place implants and to do bone augmentation and here we placed um, autogenous bone around the implants on the implant surface and over augmented with the xenogene bone, bovine bone material around the implants. Let's take a look here, next slide. Yeah, this is what you see now. The pilot drills, palatal position, so we want to stay very important always in the front two areas to stay away from the labial aspect minimum two millimeters here and here and then later on to um, to harvest some bone and to place the implants. Uh, one two is prepared for 
the uh, augmentation of the pontic area. And before we start to place our implants, we would like to, to mobilize our flap to the incisional line of the neighboring teeth. And then you can do this. Try here, even more maybe. So I went a little bit on. Then I know I will have a tensionless closure. And I think it's easy to augment these areas around these two implants after placement. Well, here you see over augmented this bovine bone and um, this co covered with a collagen membrane. And uh, on the lower right side, you see a tension free closure. We always use a, um, a um, horizontal um, supporting um, suture from the periphery, which you see here, which goes back here. You will see later on in my lecture, um, and which holds the pressure of the flap. And, um, makes it very easy to have a tension less closure in these areas. Okay, but um, so far so good. What you see now is four weeks later after augmentation, or about four weeks later, and um, then you lose again soft tissue. This is what you see in April. So if you combine on the right side, we have to deal again with resorption, and this is something we um, have to augment again. So we're always running behind soft tissue augment, uh, volume. Um, so we have to do extra augmentation of soft tissue during the second stage surgery. Baseline, then everything gets flat. Really flat, you know, after augmentation. Trying to over augment a little bit, but we never get back so nice. The peaks we have here are only very seldom. And then even after three months we can expect that it's going to look like this and um, that even more resorption is going on. Okay. And this is also what you see um, during the, um, during the um, healing phase uh, on the right side after three months horizontally. So even here we need some more augmentation. Um, okay, next slide. This is um, due to the um, situation before second stage surgery, and we want to do um, a roll flap augmentation, where you see the little error down here, and um, in order to get to the situation you see on the right side. So we started here, the prosthodontist, Reza, was um, a little bit concerned if he can manage this area here, because he said, I want to have my teeth here, and um, this patient was a musician, playing an um, instrument with his mouth, and the tooth position was very, very important, so he was very afraid, functional and aesthetic-wise, that we don't get um, the best result we could get. And what you see here now is after those roll flaps, where we used soft tissue from the pelvic side and rolled it to the implant, this is, uh, I think, a much better situation to start with for our um, restorative phase. Okay, here you see the roll flap technique. It's de-epitalized here. And we came from the palatal part and we rolled it with a split flap design to the buccal aspect in order to get to grow more volume here. And um, what you see here is some kind of um, grafting of collagen material in order to have uh, less um, wound problems for the patient here, and um, probably mucoderm would be a nice material to be placed here. Okay, so this is where we started with our restorative uh, situation after two weeks after the second stage surgery. Here the impression taking took place, um, Seda Reza and Otto Brandner, name you see on the right side, dental technician, very, very um, famous and good dental technician here in Munich. He um, started, or they started to restorative um, situation, and this is 16 days after placing this prototype crown, so we call it, um, pontic area nicely, and here are all the two centrals, I think, acceptable for this multiple tooth loss in this case, and um, um, this is where we are right now, and uh, on the right side, and this is um, where we try to stabilize it for four months, maybe to build up a little bit more pressure to get even a better result, but um, for this uh, difficult case with uh, loss of a few T's in the front, with more than one, which is always more difficult than one, two, some very 
can uh, rely on the help of the attachment of the NABTs, I think it will be an acceptable situation for the future. Okay, when we talk about the timing, um, now um, we already did actually, um, my favorite solution is to, to do an immediate implant. Because when we have an immediate implant, we can stabilize the soft tissue almost perfect. And um, immediate implant placement, for me at least, in my office, it's, um, it's reduced to um, teeth with one root and uh, there's no acute infection. So if you have pain knocking on the tooth, um, don't do immediate implant placement. I would always try to get rid of the infection, clean everything, wait for eight weeks, and um, maybe place an um, implant after eight weeks or uh, even delayed. Um, intact soft tissue, what you see here on the right side, or what you don't see on the right side, here, this is an exclusion criteria for me to do an immediate implant placement. Um, if I have intact soft tissue, I would do it in this case, of course, because I have even a little bit of excess of soft tissue. It's a very nice case maybe for immediate implant placement, but due to the fact that the soft tissue doesn't look so healthy here in this area and not intact, I would not place an implant immediately here. Um, of course, you need a gentle extraction, like um, um, with a Benek extractor. You can see on the right side, it's a very nice tool to take out um, those roots or those fractured teeth, or teeth at all. There's almost a guarantee of no crestal bone damage, um, which is uh, also a an, uh, an, um, criteria very important for me the implant placement, because when I damage this crystal part here around our teeth or roots, I don't uh, like to place an implant immediately. So if this stays intact, at least it's the first three millimeters, um, I would go to an uh, approach with an immediate implant. But if it's destroyed or uh, fractured um, or um, resorbed, I would not place an implant immediately. I would rather go to another approach. And uh, this helps a lot not to have those fractures. And of course, I think, in my opinion, it's more difficult to take out this uh, root um, nicely um, than to place an implant in this position. Also, it's um, due to the stability or the lack of bone um, and it's difficult um, to get the stability um, around our implants with the needed placement. Of course, you need a little bit of experience. And it helps a lot if you have epically of your alveolar side, if you have some bone left here, to get some <clears throat> stability. And of course, um, you get it from the palatal side because when I place the implant, I press it to the palatal ridge. Um, and this is where it belongs to anyway because I want to have a screw retained implant and I want to be as far as away, uh, away as possible from the labial aspect of my, of my socket. And uh, then when you use a um, diameter of your final drill, which is less than the implant, then, of course, you can also um, raise the amount of stability in this area and you can succeed in many, many um, cases with a immediate implant placement. And I think it has a big advantage. And I already said preservation is better than augmentation. So I like a um, minimal invasive approach, leaving the soft tissues intact, not uh, opening, the, not rising the flaps, because we see some studies sh are showing this um, as well, that we have less bone loss, less, um, um, less um, um, remodeling around our implants if we, and teeth and structures when we um, have um, a flapless uh, approach compared to a, a big, raising a bit bigger flap and um, taking away the periodontion of our bony structures. <clears throat> so, um, that means support implantat. Um, I didn't change in English, I'm sorry. This means um, immediate implant placement in any case, if possible. And this is what you see here now, and um, a case where I think we will have a good situation for the later uh, prosthetic work. This is referred by Professor Mannhardt, also from the Munich University, the conservative department this time, and um, uh, due to a um, deep fracture of this front tooth, also a bicycle accident, by the way. Um, we took out the root or the tooth, the main, the main root of 1-1, one, one, and inspected very carefully this alveolar ridge, <clears throat> and we cleaned very carefully the inside. 
And I always use a little round bird to perforate here with bony structures in order to get some reparation from the heart um, tissue by the body itself. I think it always can help and um, I think it's always useful to have a little bit of bone reparation uh, anyhow. So after perfect cleaning, um, when we have an epical infection, by the way, we also open here from this side and make an easy augmentation approach in this area, um, which uh, is no problem at all. So chronic infections down there um, don't bother me in, uh, at all. Here you see the pilot drill, palatal <coughs> orientated, and I start uh, from the direction, from the direction coming from the buccal aspect, and then um, rising the drill to the palatal side. So I get in like here, and then I rise it, or I move the drill to the palatal side parallel to the axis of the tooth, and then I do my pilot drills and my form drills for the later implant placement. Maybe the last one only to 50% of the um, of the length of the implant I want to place to get stability or maybe one diameter less in order to get a better um, stabilization. And then of course um, we like to use photo functionalization, which is a um, pretty new technique at least for us, um, tested at the University of the of California at the UCLA from Professor Ogawa. His name is here. Very nice studies and uh, very interesting maybe to discuss it. This is why I put it into here, into this lecture to show you. And <clears throat> all those work is um, depending on the fact that we have hydrocarbons which are sitting on the surface of our implants before we place them. That means implants are sterilized and then hydrocarbons during a few days, weeks, um, till it's in our office, the implant, and to replace it are sitting on our titanium surface and um, they prevent um, the bone or they, they, are, um, they are responsible for the fact that we don't have as good bone implant contact, called big, as we could have. So normally we have about 30 to 65 percent of uh, bone implant contact and after this treatment with the light, it's only a UV light which is re-sterilizing the implant surface no matter which brand you're using and um, changing the, um, the physics of our implants from hydrophobe to totally hydrophil and um, cleaning the surface from this hydrocarbon molecules and we have a better bone implant contact rate and makes it of course easier and maybe pretty more predictable for our uh, augmentation procedures and for our uh, immediate implants if you place them. It's good anyway for all kind of implant placements in my opinion, but I think we have to wait for further studies and further results, but it um, goes in that direction very hard and we have some cases where we did Ostel measurements with and without this treatment and we have a better, um, better result after we treated our implant with this photo functionalization device. It means after 10 minutes in this machine, implant surface is so clean and so hydrophile and so ready for bone contact that we have better results in the healing. But this is just a side effect to let you know what you're busy with right now or today. Here you see the implant placed on the palatal aspect and now it's important to me. I don't want to have a big, which I would have here, jumping distance. So I don't believe so much in the jumping distance. Not that I don't believe in it, but I don't want to have it in my cases. I want to have here the stabilization of a blood clot and periosteum and soft tissue is intact at the level of my bony um, wall of my uh, crestal part of my alveolar ridge in the buccal area. And um, so all I need is a stabilization is a stabilization of my blood clot around our implant. So um, I place here this xenogene um, bone substitute bovine bone around my implant and the blood will um, be stabilized very nicely in this natural structures um, of this material and um, I can decide if I want to close up here later on with a membrane or a soft tissue or <coughs> if I want to have even more in this um, part or with a heating cap whatsoever. So this depends on the situation and on the amount of soft tissue we have here. So if I want to have even more or if I have a little bit of a leakage of soft tissue 
I will add connective tissue from the pelvic side, feet to the lower graph, um, or uh, to to cover this area, and of course with a pouch technique to position it here, uh, palatal and the buccal aspect. Not removing the periostom, just prepared by a split flap design. And um, Otis is a um, it's a producer of this kind of xenogene bone material which you can use in this area and um, it's 100% natural bovine augmentation material. It gives a natural integration um, and I think this is um, much better than to have a fast resorption. So I want it to be stable in this area. So I'm very happy that this bovine bone stays very stable for a long period of time, for years, and um, gives us a 3D dimensional stability in the augmented area. The material is uh, heated up uh, up to 800 uh, degrees Celsius for extreme cleaning and um, it's a pure mineral bone matrix, um, pure hydroxyl epithets and um, of course um, natural um, history or natural bone and with a rough surface and a good adhesion uh, for our osteocytes, uh, cells which are responsible for our bone building. And these are the, the processing um, of this material, uh, how it's um, Working, it's from a femoral head of uh, of uh, cow bone, <coughs> and it um, is um, heated and cleaned and um, controlled and laid on. Um, it's um, you know, it's uh, you know, turned into granulation um, particles, bigger or smaller ones, and uh, sterilized with um, gamma radiation, and then ready for use in all cases. And I think here it's. Uh, ideal material to use. In this case, I over augmented um, this um, hard tissue um, and I made a pouch preparation, a um, split flap design at the buckle side and at the palatal side, leaving the periosteum onto the, um, the, the bone or the crest and um, I just covered it with a collagen membrane in order to have a good guideline for the soft tissue to have a nice easy closure. Um, in the case where I have good soft tissue and rather thick healthy soft tissue, I think this is enough in my experience at least of many cases to have a nice wound closure that you see here. Only a little adaptation and this will heal very fast and without any complication because this pork based collagen membrane is very nice for the heating and just to give a short look here, it's um, a natural pure collagen matrix um, and um, from pork um, skin and um, it gives um, 3D matrix um, guided uh, guideline for cells and blood vessels and it's a um, combination of resorption and protection and um, it's um, good um, support for the natural, natural heating process it will resorb after 8 to 12 weeks barrier time and it's very easy for the handling and um, very, very uh, or complication less if you're using this um, type of collagen metrics. Um, it's uh, one layer, not double layer, which has more complications and um, gives us time for the bone healing underneath and also gives time for the vascularization and integration, which is important, of course, for the building of new bone in these areas. Here you see the microscopic uh, pictures of the surface of that collagen membranes. And here the result after a few weeks before the second stage surgery. Implant was stable enough. I recommend to wait everything between two to four months and then you can go on with your um, restorative part or with the second stage surgery of course. I didn't even do a roll flap here because I had enough soft tissue so I think it was a good decision not to add extra soft tissue from the palatal side and um, what you see here is um, the situation with the heating cap. A little bit of correction of the lid band of the muscular toy, um, anatomic structures down here and the final result was a temporary crown from Professor Manhat, so only the the test crown to stabilize the soft tissue to see where it's going to be and later on we will change this into the final ceramic restoration or Professor Manhat 
you do in this case. But if you look at the outline and the height and the volume here of the pillars, I think with some very little surgical or minimal invasive surgical um, techniques, we uh, achieved in this case a nice or acceptable, good looking result for the future and um, for a good future result. And um, this is the reason why I prefer to place needed implants in many, many cases if I, if I can, if it's the right solution. Here, the design of the prosthetic work of my topic today, but it has to go hand in hand, of course, with the surgical skills that you have a good team or a good technician who can provide you with the right design here. What you see here now is a delayed immediate implant placement, option two in any case, this is why I said in any case, because when I cannot place the immediate implant, I would prefer if the defect is not big enough or not too big, uh, if it's not too big, to place a delayed immediate implant and um, it means eight weeks, six to eight weeks after extraction, I um, would proceed with my surgical approach. Here you see the tools after extraction and um, again I place the collagen membrane on top to have some soft tissue guideline or heating guideline here and uh, I can show you tonight's nice result after three days already um, I placed a membrane or a collagen uh, sponge in here it's 16 millimeters long um, 11 millimeters wide or 7 at the bottom from Botis um, uh, color cone it's called you can put it easily in there it will stabilize your plus plus or you use a collagen membrane with a split flap technique to cover everything um, it's um, stabilizing very nicely um, and it's a um, cheap um, solution or more cheap solution than the membrane if you use this color cone um, device and um, if you want you can you can uh, even treat it with antibiotics um, I never do but uh, also something some colleagues would like to to um, proceed with and here three days after the inspection you see the nice healing it looks really really good in this uh, situation and um, the tooth was percussion painful that is that's why I didn't want to place an implant and I wanted to change my concept into a delayed immediate implant okay and um, if you you're watching the movie and at the next slide um, um, this is what you get when you do it like I do it in many cases um, this is not a makeup this is um, due to the surgical approach I did with big split flaps and soft and hard tissue augmentation and I like to do it all together in one step because the soft tissue and the integration of our prosthetics don't get better if we use many approaches and if we cut more often with our knives in these areas. The patient um, um, surgery was performed at the Academy for Dentistry in Karlsruhe back then and um, I, um, I will go to the movie now and watch it with you or if you um, discuss with you a few um, things I want to show you at the surgery. <clears throat> so it was eight weeks after the extraction and um, very important to me is the uh, right flap design and um, I like, I told you already, I like to preserve tissue or material and not augment it. So I try to leave, to, to have this in, um, in tact, this papilla here. First I tried to have this intact as well, but I didn't do it later on because I need to have more visibility into the defect. But what you see now, the alveolar crest looks pretty good. We have only a little defect and the buccally aspect is not so resorbed in this, um, in this stage or after eight weeks. So it's very easy, at least um, at this crestal part, to place an implant. So I think a good decision here to wait eight weeks and to be faster than biggest part of the resorption and to place here an implant. And then of course you need a lot of tension, um, less uh, soft tissue. It means I make, I start with a full flap till the muku gingival junction here from the keratinized tissue to the mucosa and then I will perform a, a split flap way back from here. You always have to overextend it to the other side. We have a little vertical transition here at the canine. Um, in order to get a very, very tension-less closure in this area. And um, 
a nice result afterwards. I'll skip a little bit to the front. Yeah. Here you see the palatal approach. Um, there the nervous incisivus is always or many times in the way and it's not good to cut it away, better to prepare it and to to position it to, to the apical side of um, of the situation. The more injection, the patient has a little bit of pain back then and let's see what I did with the labial flap. Okay. Here you see how flexible it is and I even extend it. Normally I do the preparation not holding the flap with a pincet in order not to perforate at the apical uh, parts. It's always smaller there and easy to, to perforate here. So um, when I'm already done with most of the, of the flap, I, I go down here and hold it with a pincet and um, I extend my, my split flap. And I have an internal flap, some cosa flap, and an external one with keratinized tissue. Um, on the outside, and I can have a very close, a very safe closure, closure from the palatal aspect. You will see later on um, around the internal flap. Yeah, I will pick up the internal flap. You see here now on the inside with my sutures, and I, this will hold my flap totally and stabilize everything. And then I add some extras of tissue at the outside here in order to get more volume, and I will have a very, very safe closure in a very nice situation. What we found uh, epically was a defect, so I had to clean the defect epically, and um, we had to augment this area very easily with a um, with a xenogene bone bone and bone material again, and over augmented with um, or covered it with a collagen membrane um, because the periosteum is not intact in those areas, and I don't want to risk anything there, and so I always put a collagen membrane on top. Here you see the internal flap, so we have two flaps, maybe you can have even three flaps in some cases with bone block augmentations. And then we are ready for the implant procedure, which is not so um, interesting now because um, we have nice bone uh, epically, um, crestally, and uh, here you see the cleaning of the defect. And um, so this looks pretty good for the implant to be placed. See, this area is functioning intact here, so no big deal to place the implant now eight weeks after. Okay, this is a drilling guide. For me, important to have the circular outline, which shows me how deep I have to go with my implant. The central position, I think I would even get between two teeth without the drilling guide, but uh, the circular outline for me, very important. Here you see the drilling. I think I use the final drill only to 50% and place the implant later on. And here the implant is uh, in place. And of course I would like to add now some soft tissue from the palatal side. And I use a gingival graft from there. And I will place it to the labial aspect of my flap. I hope it's uh, working. I don't see going on. Maybe not. Okay. I was roll the implant. Maybe I want to fast with some with the video. Okay. I hope you can see it now. Um, at least in this position, this is how we take out the free gingival graft from the palatal side. Reach you region 1, 3 to 1, 6, beginning on 7, maybe. It's a good area to take out um, an internal graft and to add it at the flap, at the buckle part of the flap, in order to augment extra soft tissue. And this is what you see now here in this area. Extra soft tissue is positioned at the flap. That's the level aspect of the flap. Um, and when this is fixed and uh, in, in, um, positioned, then we start with the hard tissue augmentation, autogenous bone, own bone from the surrounding areas on top of the implant surface, and then xenogene bone material, bone and bone around this, um, 
this area um, in order to have a volume, uh, in order to have a housing for own osteocytes and blood cells and osteocytes to build um, an own bone organization in these areas. When we go back to the suturing, we need a tensionless suture situation and we um, come from the pelvic side and fix it with a lot of volume, what you see here, in front of uh, the level aspect. And um, we see now we have a lot of um, soft tissue we can deal with for our prosthetic part. And of course, again, remember the beginning of the lecture, we will have some desorption and we will running after the leak of um, some, um, some soft tissue. Okay, let's go back to the, um, to the um, lecture. Go to, to go back to, can we go back to the um, lecture? I hope, okay. You could see it, um, I got some questions that it didn't work, but I don't, I hope you, you could saw the situations in the movie. And um, the message is that when you do this, you get implant placement, that I want to have a extra volume in this stage of, of the soft tissue. No. My little, don't get my green pen. Okay, I cannot show you with my green green pen. Oh no, no, okay. Now it's working. Oh, it's back. Perfect. My little friend here <laughs> gives me some help to show you some stuff. Um, when I do a delayed implant placement, immediate or immediate delayed implant placement after six to eight weeks, I place the implant. I do bone augmentation. If it's possible, if the defect is too big, of course, I do two-stage procedure. First, hard tissue or soft and hard tissue augmentation and then the implantation. But I want extra soft tissue here. So normally, in front of cases, I add at this part of the flap a free tensional graft with the pellets inside and I uh, add some extra soft tissue here. And then I can still change uh, with the roll flap or with certain vestibular plastics or uh, again, at the second stage, we add some more soft tissue in order to go into the prosthetic phase with a extra volume of soft tissue because this is what I need. And if you look now at the impression post of this Kenbock implant um, 3.8, it's um, covered with a lot of soft tissue and we have to come here with the outline. It's um, the exact or ideal position from the neighboring tooth. And um, I think we have now enough soft tissue to play with or to position in this prosthetic phase. In this case, I did the prosthetic work by myself. And again, if um, I work together in a team or with a prosthodontist, this is what I want to deliver. So in any case, what we need is we need a certain concept. We need um, skills, of course, for this certain technique we like to, to, um, to, um, yeah, to go through. And we need a good eye to plan cases. And if we're motivated and tomorrow on Tuesday or any day when you're watching it the next day, um, we see a patient getting into our office at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock or whenever you start, and it's this situation, <coughs> then um, we can do two things, not start the case because then somebody else has this problem, or we... Um, we analyze it uh, and have a coffee and the hope that at 9 o'clock a better patient is coming. But if we analyze it correctly, we see that it's maybe not so difficult, or at least in this case. Um, we don't need this big overbite here. We don't need this class 2, 2 occlusion um, extruding here. So we shorten the teeth a little bit here. That means we don't have to be so good with our soft tissue surgery in these areas here. And um, of course, we can concentrate on um, this tooth to two because this doesn't look so bad. So this is my my um, basis of my planning. The soft tissue outline looks pretty good compared to the two three. So we keep this. We make a crown lengthening very predictable here, and then the second quadrant, the second part here of our upper jaw, the left part is solved pretty predictable. This it looks like now. And on the other side, okay, we get rid of both teeth and placing only one implant because it's not enough space to have five millimeters in between those two implants. So it's only one implant with a pontic here in this area. And of course we have to augment your hardness of tissue 
and with a lot of augmentation of the Pontic area, we can hope that we will get a situation like here. And I think this case, at least for the patient, is acceptable solved. It's um, already eight to ten years in function, case it is in the Netherlands with metal ceramic crowns. Maybe we can do better today, but I'm very happy because it's still healthy and it's looking okay and the patient is happy and um, this is what we want, happy patients and stable results over the years. And these cross concepts are very important to me um, because we want to have parallel situations of the gingival outline, parallel to the bipupillar line, parallel to the incisional line. These are the most important factors at the, if we are looking um, at our cases from the aesthetic point of view. And um, if you're concentrating now on 2, 2 and 2, 3, these are the teeth who had to be extracted. And if I only plan my implants like this, it's probably in the wrong position because if you're really critical, this canine could be a little bit longer. I don't mean you need to make it longer with a crown lengthening, but you could because um, this would be maybe the better position. You can discuss to do some um, orthopedic treatment back here due to space problems, or you discuss if you maybe turn this lateral, which can look very nice in my opinion. But you need to place the implant deeper then, because this should be parallel and uh, same position then this canine here, if you do the crown lengthening approach here. And then you need to be three millimeters below. So all those points have to be in the planning, and it's not only surgical planning, it's a lot of prosthetic planning. And those are the measurements and the numbers you should know in those DIVA advanced functions cases, and um, these are the lines you should take care of anytime you do frontal surgery. And the emergency profile, sometimes it's even better the case we had to repair afterwards, maybe, but um, it's so difficult. The implant was placed too much to the labial aspect that we decided to leave it intact because the mock up shows that the lip is covering this area, this critical area, and we get can get uh, along with it with red aesthetics here. The patient is much more happy than taking out this implant and place it maybe different. This can happen to everybody, by the way. Um, it's done by a very, very experienced um, maxillofacial surgeon and um, it's not to point with a finger on it, just to show you how difficult it would be to change this and um, it was um, already twice uh, we made the, um, the approach to, to get a better soft tissue result with augmentation of um, grafted material here and um, as you see here the more you use the scalpel to get to this area the worse it gets so I didn't dare to do a second approach. Prosthetic wise, it was enough to solve it with a red um, aesthetic zone or ceramic here, as you see in the slide. So, prosthetic can also be a good friend of our surgeons because it can help us a lot and we don't have to be so good in all the cases. So, when we have those cases here, um, I can never promise you that we will get um, a result without red aesthetics. There will be a lot of cases where we have to do this here, red ceramic, in order to get acceptable acceptable results, or we have to accept long white teeth, and there will be only a few cases where I'm good enough to augment hardness of tissue, as you see here in this pontic area. So this is a bridge um, um, stable already for almost 10 years. Metal ceramic with titanium abutments, not shaped like I would like to have today. I would never accept this anymore in the CAT CAM times. The outline, if you have a cemented bridge, which, uh, which is in my eyes still perfect, but the outline has to be only one millimeter subgingival here in order to be able to get rid of the cementum here. Most lucky that it worked in, in this case, maybe. And the drilling guide, if you have a drilling guide, no matter which technique you use, this information is what you need. You need the outline. You don't need to place all the implants um, you see here or for every um, plant drilling hole, you don't need to place an implant, but um, I think you need this outline and you then you choose your pontics wherever you want to and regarding to the better bone you have. So don't make life too complicated. Go back to the bone you you can rely on the result. And um, if not, we can, if you cannot achieve good results or if we cannot do, um, there's still, or there are still other solutions like here, big case is a removal device where dental technicians like your Lotz here can make uh, wonderful results, even with artificial red or pink aesthetics, no matter due to which surgical technique 
you used or to which um, um, outcome you came. And just um, beside information, this next composite phase from Ibuclar is very nice for those soft tissue treatments. And um, the most problematic um, thing is around planning. So if you start your cases, the mistake is done already before you take your scalpel in your hands because success in 75% uh, um, due to an um, investigation of um, Professor Wiesmeyer from Amsterdam is to the correct treatment decision. So the type of surgery, the type of timing, the type of material you want to use is depending a lot on the treatment planning, on your skills of course, and on the technique you want to use. And this is something, no matter which material or hardware you use, is what we don't want to have in our offices, I think. Um, we will agree absolutely in this point. And um, I think it's already an art to place the implants like this so close to each other um, um, in order to, um, to have a patient result which is acceptable. Okay, I am uh, see from the time, I'm already at the end of my lecture. Oh, skipped, I want to go to the discussion. I hope I can. I brought a lot of slides for you today. It's just what I want to, to emphasize at the end of my lecture. Um, this is a case where we had to do late implant placement with uh, Block augmentations, um, something which is a totally different topic we really have to discuss very closely. And um, I, what I want to show at the end of my lecture, here yeah, it is, last few slides, um, said it's very, very important to, um, to um, have soft tissue. And when we do second stage surgery, no matter which surgical approach we were um, deciding for, we never open the bone, we never, we never take off the periosteum from the bony structures. We have always connected tissue around our um, implants or at our, um, our um, or on top of our bony la uh, layer and uh, on top of our implants. And we work with vestibulum plastics. Maybe my green friend can come again. A little error, no, it's not coming. But, but, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, perfect. Good assistant here. You can always work in my office if you want. Um, what you see here is this is keratinous tissue from the pelvic part in order to get more soft tissue here or more quality, a good quality of soft tissue. And we augment even a little bit of um, connective tissue here on top of our implants. And this stays on top of the bone. So we don't open the bone, we just make split flap designs to have uh, good coverage on our implants. And this is two weeks after second stage surgery. You see healthy structures. You still see some resolvable monophile clipo lane um, sutures in here, but very stable, very nice, and good looking result already. Also, we did this um, approach after two weeks, and this is what we need healthy soft tissue around the implants. I think we should always focus on the soft tissue. Of course, the hard tissue is what we need and what we have to have. And maybe in cases with a lot of augmentation or different different surgical techniques, um, thinner implants here 3.8, for example, for those molars, there was a lot of augmentation vertically and horizontally, are much better than thicker ones or much safer. And then, because we don't want to have any um, any um, compromises, we have abutments in the right design of a molar. And we can all do this by placing the implants deep enough by having good healthy soft tissue. Uh, around having the right material, like the dioxide, and then getting the right prosthetics. I think we really have to concentrate on the soft tissue integration. And I think here you see a conical connection of an um, abutment and implant, and here you see a butt joint connection. Even this doesn't really matter. I think um, platform shifting is a good uh, is a good way to treat those cases, but the soft tissue and the integration I think is very important. Thank you very much for your um, attention and for joining me um, tonight or this evening with the lecture. And um, I'm happy to ask uh, to answer the questions I see here on the left side. Okay, maybe um, I go into the question. 
Uh, okay. Dr. Ellen Bergnan, what about if you have no choice and need to cement a central tooth or an implant, do you still use zirconia abutments even in small diameter implants? Oh, okay. Um, the implant uh, diameter called 3.5. Um, it depends on uh, on the implant um, brand. Um, most of the implant brands don't um, accept to have a central incisor on a 3.5 millimeter implant. For example, Noble BioCare, they have a 3.5. They only want to have laterals or lower incisors made with a 3.5. Very nice to have a 3.0 for the lower incisor, for example, or with lateral. It's a Noble Active. Um, 3.5, no, I would not um, place an um, in central incisor on a 3.5 millimeter implant. Whereas, for example, other systems like the Vita implant system, I don't know if it's still on the market, they had a 3.5 screw um, compared to a 3.8 or 3.7, um, free for molars, premolars, and for central incisors. And um, there I would place an in central incisor. So it's depending on the material of the implant brand, of the stiffness. Um, of the investigation of, of the implant systems, if they are um, giving it, uh, if they are allowing us to place an incisor or a molar or whatsoever on this diameter. But in general, um, I would say for central incisor, something like 3.75, 3.8, 4.0, 4.3, depending on the system you like to use, is ideal. And maybe better 3.8 than 4.3 or 4.0, depending a little bit also on the size of the um, socket. So I hope I had a good answer for you for this question. Um, Dr. Alex Schenker, does carbone, cowbone, uh, cow resorb? Do you believe that there must be a declaration as a medical drug for cerebone? Do you think that cowbone is healthy for humans? Um, difficult question. Um, I uh, I think. Um, that we have a lot of uh, literature of uh, of uh, cow bone that it um, that it works very well and uh, very safe and very stable for um, for our patients. Um, depending uh, on which uh, which brand they're using, um, if you look at other products which are using cow bone, we have very very good uh, results and very stable results. So I think um, it's a material we, we can use for our patients. Um, I um, I don't know exactly about resorbing. I don't know if anybody knows about resorbing, but uh, it will take years, and I don't think it resorbs um, after 12 years or longer. So uh, this gives us even the benefit to have a stable situation. Yvonne, Dr. Yvonne Evans, when drilling is a, is a patient under general anesthesia? Okay. Um, nitrous oxide or just local? Also, how long does it uh, does this procedure usually take? Thank you. Um, if I uh, place implants in my patients, maybe 95% are done under local anesthesia. Especially if you use a technique like I showed you, um, delayed immediate delayed implant placement or uh, immediate implant placement. You don't need um, general anesthesia in most of the patients. Maybe in 98 of the patients. If patients are very afraid of everything, then um, maybe it's uh, necessary to, to do this or um, to, to get the help of a general anesthesia. Um, anesthesia. But um, I would say um, with the procedures I showed you here, it's not necessary and it's not even useful in, in my eyes, depending a little bit on, um, on, uh, on the experience you have in your team and on your patients. But I think it's normally no problem at all. Um, Dr. Petro, where was place of tissue graft in this case? So I think you are um, referring to the um, to the video I showed you, and um, I took a free gingival graft, connective tissue graft, uh, from the pelvic side without epithelium on the inside of the inside of the pelvic uh, region one three one four to uh, one six in the area, and I suited it to the buccal aspect of the flap, just at the area where I want to have some extra volume. It means especially vertically, um, and I also position it a little bit underneath the palatal part of my, my flap, of my incision, 
uh, on top of, of there. And I think if you switch it to the flap, it's uh, very helpful for the notification of the graph. And uh, I don't see any complications if you do so. And you should turn it um, the right way that you took it out also upside down, same way upside down um, at the um, postal uh, at the, um, area you want to, to place it. So I hope I also answered this question precisely enough. Dr. Teche Teddy Dovska, you, you do not cover the xenograft with a membrane. Um, this is not true. Um, this is not true. I oh depends. Um, when um, when I place an implant immediately after extraction, I want my xenograft to be um, to um, to um, stabilize the blood clots or blood, um, which is uh, which is um, necessary in this area. So this is, um, the use of the xenograft in this area to stabilize my blood clots. Um, and then I, uh, I cover it many times when it's stable enough with a um, heating cap, with a white body or with a white heating cap. Or um, I have an individual heating cap maybe in some cases or even a prosthetic device already, which means an immediate um, prosthetic device on top. And um, to help me to close prosthetic-wise the socket, um, when I have no, not enough stability or when I need even more soft tissues than I have already, then I would cover it with an extra soft tissue graft from the um, palatal aspect, like pre um, connective graft in this area, or um, I would cover it less, like I showed you in, in one case with a collagen membrane, just to have a good guideline for the soft tissue to have a closure on top of my membrane. Okay, so I hope I could uh, answer you this question. Um, Dr. Shiva's teacher, when you do the connective tissue graft, do you harvest any periosteum with it? Um, normally, yes. Um, it's um, no problem to do so, in my opinion. Um, but you have to, to consider that we, lately we like to have, uh, um, to take out um, um, the, um, the connective tissue graft from a more uh, upper area because the quality is much better there and we're even thinking about taking a free central graft and de it to position it um, on top of your flap so there um, there is not, um, not um, yeah it's not a fixed concept but normally or what we always used to do is take a full full graft connective tissue graft leave everything intact have a primary closure and to leave the periosteum on top and just get rid of the fat cells and clean it a little bit, thin it out and position it in the buccal aspect of the flap. So I hope I could answer you this question and you see sometimes there's a developing in our techniques and the way we're working and um, sometimes we, we do it a little bit different and this also belongs to the gray zone where I told you implant dentistry is never gray or white, it's always, um, it's never black or white, it's always a little bit gray too in between. Um, Dr. Giovanni Restrepo Osario, after socket preservation, how long do you wait for placing an implant? Um, okay, this is something I didn't answer you today because it dep it's depending on the material you want to use for socket preservation. That means um, I wanted to make clear that um, I prefer personally to place an implant, implant immediately or to wait six to eight weeks before I go back, place the implant, and do augmentation procedures. If I want to make a socket preservation, um, I would rather do um, go over to use autogenous bone or bone from a um, from a human being I can place into the socket. Um, depending a little bit on uh, the working style or the way you want to, to work with which product, um, if you want to, to use this kind of uh, material, and we have very nice results in a few cases yet. And um, with socket preservation, with uh, bone from a human being placed in there, or with uh, very nice results with own bone harvested from the regional molar area or from the tuberostum. Um, and then we wait for uh, with autogenous bone for the patient himself for three to four months. And with, um, with donor bone from another patient, 
we wait for like bone builder matrices. Um, Boats we wait for um, for four to five months, more directly to five months. So I hope I could answer the question, but this is only in some cases um, where the defect is uh, very big and where I want to start with augmentation after extraction. And um, I'm not a big fan of using synergy material like I showed you today for um, socket preservation because then um, going to the literature or to other doctors who are showing good results, you have to wait at least six or better eight months before you place your implants. Dr. Ellen um, Gardnon, I use sometimes 3.8 millimeter implants with 3.5 millimeter connection by Horizon. Um, okay, first question. I don't see the other questions. Um, if this is okay and, uh, and working fine, um, please do so. Um, this is depending totally on the hardware you like to use and on the implant system you like to use. And as we know, um, the implant system or the screw itself, um, if you have um, a good working, good documented system, are not um, are not uh, exclusion criterion for one or the other technique and working pretty fine. Um, webinar uh, two. Thank you for the question. Okay. Um, so I cannot help you so much with the horizon question because I'm not so familiar with this implant type. But uh, of course I know it. And um, if this is platform shifting and 3.5 fits on 3.8, and if it's um, if it's okay from the company to do this, then um, please do it. I think it's a good way of, of treating that cases. Um, okay, Dr. Yvonne Evans, um, <laughs> thank you too. Um, for this nice note. And oh yeah, now another question of Dr. Elm Gagnon. Um question related uh, on zirconia abutments on small implants. Um zirconia abutments to me means always hybrid abutment, uh, it means titanium interface with the implant and not uh, full zirconia, not full ceramic abutment connected in a titanium implant. Um and um then of course I think you should connect. Um Zirconium abutments with, uh, with implants, especially in the aesthetic zone and even the posterior region, like you saw in the last slide, because um, I think it's always better to have zirconium in contact with our soft tissues. Okay, and uh, of course, thank you very much too for your um, last um, comment here, Mr. Gagnon. Okay, thank you. I think these are all the questions, and um, I hope I could um, answer you. Um, uh, could give you right answers to your questions and um, thank you very much for attending the lecture today. Thank you very much Dr. Ransofer for sharing your lecture and your insightful information with us. We'd also like to thank Botis for making this online course possible and thank you, our wonderful audience, for your interest and participation. The C quiz is now available online on the course page and completing it will allow you to earn your ADA SERP CE credits. The recording will be posted online within the next 48 hours. You'll receive an email notification with a link to the recording. Further questions for Dr. Ranshofer may be submitted directly on the website, on the courses page, under the Ask the Expert tab. So please go ahead and submit your questions and Dr. Ranshofer will be sure to get back to you as soon as possible. Please be sure to visit the BOTIS educational platform, www.botisacademy.com, and keep an eye out for a growing schedule of online courses. Thank you again to all, take care, and goodbye.